people are put in bondage as they are trying to somehow make God like them. Trying to make God notice them, to listen to them. And I just want you all to know that too is unbiblical. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Notice he didn't say, if you keep my commandments, I'll love you. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You see, the issue of whether Jesus loves them was never, was never an issue. It was already given. He already loves them. He already loves you. It's already there. He was focusing on whether or not you love him. And yet, people in religious bondage just can't seem to accept the fact that God has loved them because it's been ingrained by these teachings, by this misuse of the law of God, that they have to be good enough. And what is this and what does this false teaching uh, produce? Well, for one thing, it uh, makes people resent God. They're thinking to myself, why, God, did you even bother creating me if I have to somehow work to earn your love? If I have to somehow work to, to earn care, your care? If I have to somehow work to make you care about me, why'd you even bother making me? Yeah, that's oppression. You know, uh, Jesus uh, called out uh, the Pharisees of his day. Back in uh, Matthew um, 23, verse 4, he called them out saying, The Pharisees have put heavy, heavy burdens upon my people that are hard to bear, and they don't bother to even lift a finger to help them carry it. That is in total contrast to what Jesus said when he's what Jesus said when he said my yoke is easy and my burden is light Jesus acknowledges yes there is a yoke but it's easy he acknowledges yes there is a burden but it is light and furthermore and not only does it lead to resentment of God but it also leads to a prideful heart Because, because when you think that you've done good, that you've done enough, when you think that, okay, now I'm good enough to make God uh, listen to me, you become like the Pharisee who said, uh, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, the swindlers, the unjust, the adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast uh, twice a week and I give a tenth of everything I have to the poor. See, I'm doing all these good things and I'm avoiding all these bad things. So now God has to hear my prayer. And that's pride. And as we all know, uh, the Pharisee did not walk away justified before God. Hmm. So, if... If grace devoid of law is not true, and if law devoid of grace is not true, what is the truth? The truth is found in Psalm 1. Every, everybody turn to Psalm 1. The psalmist writes, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. Look what it says. His delight is the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord is delightful to him. Do you know what delight is? It's, it's a pleasure. Thank it's a joy. It's something he just likes doing. It's a delight. And then in verse 3, he says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does 
shall prosper. Lord, thank you, Jesus. This is the result of obeying the law of God. Be planted by the rivers of water that bring forth his fruit in his season. His leaves shall also not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Thank you, Lord. Wow. That does not sound oppressive to me, does it? No. That, the law of God, sounds like a blessing to me. If one delights in it. Well, how does the law of God become a delight to anybody? Well, I'll tell you right now, you cannot make yourself delight in the law of God. You can't do it. Delighting in the law of God begins first and foremost with delighting in God himself. Yeah. If you want to delight in the law of God, you have to first delight in God himself. You have to seek after him first. In one of the Psalms, he writes, um, As the deer panteth for the streams of water, so my soul longeth after you. Mm -hmm. After him. After God. I am thirsty, so I yearn not for the law of God, but for God himself. And when, and when he gets close to God, when he knows the love of God, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season. So, you thirst for God, but when, but when you have God and you begin to understand his ways, his law, then you have the water. You are being nourished. You are, your thirst is being quenched. You see, the psalmist has reached a point where he loves God and everything about him, including his law. So anything that comes from God, including his law, including his law has to be good. And therefore, he loves it. And therefore, I desire to do what is of God. And that is to do his law. Now, I think, I think we owe it to ourselves to, just, to uncover the benefits of uh, observing God's law, to walking, to walking in the law of God, to walking in the commandments of God. And for that, we turn, our, we turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible. 170 some verses. And the whole book, the whole psalm, is dedicated to the love of the law of God. I don't think that's coincidence. I think that God himself is trying to drive home a point here. I've found that there are 11 benefits to uh, observing the law of God. All right. Benefit one, there is power to resist sin. In verses one through three, blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of, of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Do that? Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of in the Lord. If you're walking in the way of the Lord, you will be undefiled. Yes, you will do no iniquity. Why? Because the, the way of the Lord, the laws of the Lord, keep you from sin. They tell you this is how you avoid sin, and therefore that's how you have power over it. Oh yes. The devil may tempt you. The devil, the devil may tempt you, but he cannot touch you if you're walking in the ways of the Lord. He cannot. It's only when you get off the ways of the Lord can he assume any kind of authority over you. And then in verse 9, How can a young man cleanse, cleanse his way? By taking heed according to your word. The law is a cleanser. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is a cleanser. Second benefit is joy. There is joy to be found 
and the law of God. Verse 16. I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. There's that word delight. Again, pleasure. And then verse 24. Your testimonies are also my delight and my counselors. Verse 35. Make me walk in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. See? Delight is, is appearing all over this book. He is just, the psalmist is just overflowing with pleasure in, in simply talking about the law of God. Verse 3, I mean, I'm sorry, benefit 3, is strength. Verse 28, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. Strengthen me according to your word. In the word is strength for us. When we are weak, the word of God gives us strength. Benefit four is freedom. In verse 45, and, will, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. There's liberty to be found in, in walking in God's precepts. I mean, before, we were slaves to sin, slaves to, the, slaves to the devil. But when those bondages are broken, we find ourselves seeking after the ways that uh, lead us out of bondage. See, there's no bondage in the law of God, none whatsoever. There's liberty. Okay, and then we look, then we turn to verse 46, we have, where we find benefit 5, there's no shame. Verse 46, I will speak of your testimonies also before kings and will not be ashamed. Will not be ashamed. Because after all, if, you're, uh, if your walk is producing one uh, where you can resist sin, where it has joy, where you can find strength and there's freedom... How can you possibly be ashamed of it? You just can't be. So again, there is no shame in uh, walking in the law of God. But there certainly is shame if you're walking in sin. A lot of shame. Okay, benefit six. Comfort and suffering. That's found in uh, verses 50 through 52. It says, this is my comfort in my affliction, for your word has given me life. The proud have me in great derision, yet I do not turn aside from your law. I remembered your judgments of old, O Lord, and have comforted myself. The psalmist uh, recalls the judgments of the Lord against uh, the wicked and the sinful. And he, just, and he realizes God will deal with these oppressors uh, in, a, in, his, in his time. Therefore, I take comfort in that. I take comfort that I am in right standing with him. Benefit 7, a thankful heart. Verse 62. At midnight I will rise to give thanks to you because of your righteous judgment. God's righteous ju judgment just drives them to be thankful. And gratitude. Now, oh, gratitude is just uh, something that's uh, strongly emphasized in the, uh, in the New Testament. When, uh, he, when Jesus healed the ten lepers and only one uh, came back to show him gratitude, he, Jesus, Jesus asked, where are the other nine? You know, the lack of gratitude he got from the other nine got his attention. But when you're walking in the ways of the Lord, you will be thankful and you will give God thanks for it. Yes. It's just simply a fruit of walking in the ways of, God, of God's law. Number, benefit eight, understanding. Verse 73. Your hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. Verses 99 and 100. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients because I keep your precepts. 
<laughs> I mean, uh, I don't, I don't need to explain that. It's, uh, per, it's pretty clear cut and dry. The more you meditate on more of God's law, the greater your understanding. Goes, after, because everything begins with God, doesn't it? Yeah. It all begins with God. All understanding of everything, whether it be science, whether it be uh, economics, mathematics, uh, you name it, it all begins with God. And the more you know, the more you know of His law, the more you know of Him, and thus the thus greater is your understanding. Okay. Benefit nine: a clean life. Verse eighty. Let my heart be blameless regarding your statutes, that I may not be ashamed. And then verse 140. Your word is very pure. Your word is very pure. I say that again. Therefore, your servant loves it. <laughs> he loves the purity of God's word. He loves it. There is nothing dirty, there is nothing foul about it. And the servant is just blown away by the purity of the word. Okay, okay benefit, benefit 10, personal revival. Personal revival. Go to, go to verse 149. Hear my voice according to your loving kindness. O Lord, revive me according to your justice. Then verse 154. Plead my cause and redeem me. Revive me according to your word. And then verse 159. Consider how I love your precepts. Revive me, O Lord, according to your loving kindness. You want to be revived? You find it in the word. Read the word, believe the word, and God will revive you. And then finally, benefit 11, a worshipful heart. Verse 164. Seven times a day I praise you because of your righteous judgments. Verse 171. My lips shall utter praise, for you teach me your statutes. And then verse 175. Let my soul live and it shall praise you, and let your judgments help me. <laughs> How sad is it that when people think of the law of God, they think of, they think of burdens, you know? They think of oppression. They think of uh, being in bondage. When it's, when it's the complete opposite, it's the total opposite. There's joy. There's peace, there's peace, <coughs> there's prosperity. Your soul prospers through the observance of the law of God. And what a shame it is that uh, so many people don't realize this. Even, there are even teachers of the law that, uh, that, don't, that don't realize this. You know, they, they too see it as uh, they do see it as oppressive and uh and i think it's out of their bitterness that they uh, teach it that's why there's no love in their uh, teachings you know because that's how they were brought up you know to believe that uh, the law of god is burdensome and it's and you're supposed to be miserable doing it but that's the cross you gotta bear for being a christian when it's the complete opposite the total opposite. Okay, and the final point that I want to make in regards to uh, the law of God is the spirit of the law. What is the spirit of the law of God? It's love. Yeah. Every law that God gives is done out of love. And uh, the law is supposed to uh, drive us to love one another. Let's go back to Romans, chapter 13. Verses 8 through 10. Okay. 
Paul writes, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covenant, covet, and if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. You know, think about, uh, you think about uh, the Ten Commandments. <coughs> and we talk about um, how, ho how holy the commandments are and um, how severe the punishment is for uh, going against the commandments. Yeah, we've all heard that. But did you ever stop to consider the love that went into giving the commandments? Well, I mean, think about it. Uh, first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. Well, there is only one God. I mean, if you pursue other gods, it's a, it's a fruitless venture. It's a fruitless search. God is saying, I'm the only God for you to search after. So that's why you should put, should put me first above all other gods. So, so, then there's the uh, second commandment. You shall not make your... For, Make for yourself a graven image. Again, it, it ties in with the uh, first uh, ties in with the uh, first commandment. Graven images, they can become gods. You know, and not just statues, but houses and cars, and cash, and all kinds of material things. They don't. They're not going to love you. You know, they're not going to provide for you. They're not going to save for you. They won't, uh, and they're not going to save you in the end. Only God can do that. So again, God is saying, don't look at that stuff. Look at the one who does care about you. Verse, commandment uh, three. Uh, you shall not take uh, the name of your Lord God in vain. God is simply establishing, listen, I am great. I am very, very great. I am so great that to uh, speak my name in some kind of um, in some kind of casual, frivolous uh, manner is a great offense. It helps you understand how great God is and how powerful He is, and thus how trustworthy He is and how good it is to serve Him and be submissive to Him. Uh, number four: Remember the Sabbath day and keep it keep, keep it holy. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh you shall rest. God is saying, don't work yourselves to death. I am commanding you to rest. I am commanding you to, to, for one day out of the week, not concern yourself with work. Not concern yourself with making a living. Instead, enjoy a day of rest and come into my presence. Focus on me. Because being in, the God, being in God's presence is so much better than working, is it not? Yeah. But, however, um, most people just don't see it that way. They're obsessed with work, and they, and they work themselves to death. That's what God is trying to save them from. Commandment 5, honor your father and mother. Well, the, fam the family is a reflection of God's uh, relationship uh, with the church. And uh, he also understands that in a family, there has to be authority. A and it comes down from the mother and the father. And it's uh, for the sake of uh, the mother and father that God commands you are to respect your parents. Because listen, you know, Parents are going to make mistakes. Parents are going to do things that they shouldn't do. It happens sometimes. But that should not give you an excuse to defy their authority. You know, in spite of your parents' mistakes, still honor them. Still realize that God put them in charge of the family. 
because if you uh, choose to go off and be rebellious and just shun their authority, then, um, well then, how are you going to be raised? How are you going to be brought up right? Who then is going to teach you the ways of God? Okay. And then you have, uh, then you have uh, 6 through 10. You shall not steal. You shall not commit murder. You shall not lie. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not covet. At first, uh, those things sound oppressive, but at the same time, but at the same time, they also protect you. You know, just as you can't steal from somebody else, nobody's allowed to steal from you. Just as you're not allowed to lie to somebody, nobody's allowed to lie to you. Just as you're not supposed to commit adultery with someone, nobody's supposed to commit adultery against you, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Those last five commandments, they're not just to protect others from you, but it's also to protect you from others. See? It's all, all, all of those commandments given from a God who cares. And it's because he cares so much that he wants us to observe them. It's because he cares so much. And, ultimate, and also... The Ten Commandments, they embody the very character of God. And that is what God wants us to take on. And that is His character. His character. Not the character of the devil, but His character. And when you get born again, you also get God inside of you. And thus, you now have the ability to take on God's character. So, rather than just dismiss the laws, to dismiss the commands and say, they're not, they don't save me, I don't, I don't need to worry about them. Instead, we should meditate on them and realize, you know, these are not just simply rules. These are not just simply regulations. This is who God wants me to be. This is the character he wants me to take. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Oh, Welcome. This is Sister Joan, Secretary for Upper Room Ministry. You can see the rest of this message each Sunday evening, your local time. If you would like to receive our monthly newsletter and know the things the Lord is speaking to Prophet Humphrey, then please send a love offering to help cover our expenses. Also, if you would like to have an anointed prayer cloth and become a ministry partner, send us your picture so we can pray, lay hands on you and your need, and expect signs, wonders, and miracles in your life starting today. You will never be the same. If you would like to schedule a speaking engagement, contact our ministry. All glory to Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs>